go along um but i kind of don't think they'll be able to follow along because there's lots of like pre-installations that you have to do for this um so hopefully if okay. you want to do that part next week if people do watch this back or whatever download everything they need then next week they'll be able to participate with their own data so maybe if there were some links uh, to the to the package site by the end of the before we close out maybe you could curate a few of those as you go along and drop them in the chat and then i'll put them up on the website yeah definitely. okay yeah okay nice recording has started so i'm handing over george wager on the amazing Go. <laughs> Deep lab cut. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, so I hope everyone can um, see this. Let's just present a view. But it always does this to me. Okay, so we're today we're kind of looking at deep lab cut. Um, the reason that we're looking at this is mainly because it's interesting for my PhD. Um, so I'm learning kind of as I go along, and I'm just here to share with you today what I've learned so far, and then hopefully next week I'll have learned a lot more um, and have a lot more to share for you, share with you. Um, but basically, it's just a software package um, for animal pose estimation. Um, it's been used quite a lot with like mice, um, cheetahs, but also humans. Uh, and the main kind of problem is within AI, it's very difficult to detect motion and then identify that motion as a certain behaviour. For example, someone picking their nose or someone scratching their head. It's very easy to identify the object of someone. Um, but it's not easy to identify the behaviour that that object is expressing. So that is the problem that it's trying to solve. Um, obviously, with 2D image detection, it's a lot simpler and a lot of development has kind of already gone into 2D detection with things like YOLO, um, ResNet, um, convolutional neural networks. It, there's a lot of algorithm development that's gone into it. Um, a lot, I'd say, has probably been driven by driverless cars. A lot of the research and priority has been that, I'd say, that's quite readily available. Um, it's probably the most heard of problem. Um, but how does Deep Lab Cut solve the problem of being able to detect motion? Basically, it kind of does that by identifying the body parts first. Um, you have to put in labeled data. And within that labeled data, you aren't labeling the object as a mouse or labeling the object as um, a cow. You are labeling the parts of that object. So, for example, if it's the mouse's foot, you'd say, yeah, mouse foot. Um, but you might go one step further and say mouse right foot, mouse left foot, front back, foot front right, back front, back right. The bottom here is kind of one of the most interesting papers that they've got on it that kind of explains it the best. It's in Nature, um, Nature Protocols, and it's using Deep Lab Cut for 3D markerless pose estimation. Um, they've given examples across multiple species, but they have got individual papers published for all the different kind of applications. They also have a massive web page where they talk about the things that are currently ongoing. One of the biggest things that they're trying to work on is obviously obtaining as much high quality training data um, so they can improve their kind of um, portfolio, I guess. They have um, different models for different applications and they've labeled this the model zoo. So within that model zoo, you can get multiple different models that are more specific. So there might be one that's a little bit better um, tailored to humans and that might start off with the basic ResNet and then they've basically added on uh, models to create a kind of ensemble um, and improve that that application. Sorry, my dog's a bit, I've got my mum's dog today and she's got separation anxiety, she's just a bit all over the shop. Um, so some of the applications, it extracts user-defined key body parts, so obviously user-defined, that is what you've told it to extract initially. So you could say that this is a supervised learning model. Um, 
and obviously it does humans as well as as well as every other animal. Here are some of the examples. So you've got mice tracking in open fields, um, pose estimation in human babies, and locomotion studies in rodents. Um, and one of the kind of main videos that they show is like a little kind of, I don't want to say the word cage, but it's kind of like boxy-ish. Um, and the, the rodent is basically running around in it. Um, and they've basically identified, you know, which direction it's running in. Here is an example of the cheetah one. So here, this one is kind of slightly different in the way that they have done multiple different camera angles. A lot of the previous studies are just based on one camera angle. Like, for example, the rodent locomotion one is the camera is above um, and the, the mouse is just like below. Um, the mice is below. And then this one here, the reason that this one is kind of slightly different is they've got six different camera angles and what they've done is they have predicted the different phases through each camera angle and then they have then anticipated what the next move is of the cheetah but obviously to do that initially they have had to be able to understand what are the movements of a cheetah when it's hunting um, and that is while it's hunting um, so they did this to be able to understand the, the biomatics of, of a cheetah whilst it's hunting. Um, the other kind of interesting thing is this, is how they actually, obviously we just see here a picture of a cheetah hunting with dots on, but then here they've actually turned it into kind of mathematical. You know, they've basically taken the points, they've applied it to a 3D um, scale, and then they've labelled it and then they've looked at those points in relation to all the other points to be able to predict the next move of the cheetah and add a mathematical value to it. So that's uh, a quite an interesting one. They haven't actually, as far as I'm aware, published the paper on this yet. Um, I think it is it, it, in the making. Where should it down, please? So the main workflow um, with Deep Lab, Lab Cut is First of all, open in a Python session. Then you can import Deep Lab Cut. Now, Deep Lab Cut is available on Git, um, so you can always use the most recent update. Obviously, there's always people adding more information and more improvements. So probably the, the Deep Lab Cut that we look at today might be different tomorrow. Um, you can always go back to the original one that you've used, or you can keep pulling down the latest one from Git. Then you create a project. Um, by creating a project, what we're talking about is that main kind of file structure. Um, now, if you've never used kind of artificial intelligence or computer vision before, the way it kind of works is you have your training data set and within your training data set, you've got the image, but then you've also got the metadata for the label. So you've got the image and the label. Um, so when we say creating a project, that's basically what you're doing here. You're basically creating that structure so then you know where your images are going to go, you know where your labels are going to go, you know what's going to be your training data set, and you know what's going to be your test data set. Um, then for number four, selecting the frames. So what this does is because we're dealing with video footage, um, that's the main purpose of the Deep Lab Cut, is we're looking at the motion expressed from an object through a video. It basically adds a frame rate. Now there is loads of tuning that you can do here. You can you can do different bits. I, can't, I don't fully understand all the different things that go on, but there's many different settings. Um, so it's quite a rabbit hole that you can go down. Um, and then there is the labeling of those frames. Now, when we say labeling of those frames, it is labeling that unique kind of point within that object or animal. So foot, back right, back left, front right, front left. Um, and then finally, training the network. So the main thing that I've kind of covered in these slides will be um, part one, part two, part three, um, and part four and a little bit of part five. But I've not gone into massive detail on it because I still need to gain some further understanding on that and make sure that, you know, it is good enough and I'm doing it in the with the most accurate and uh, unbrain frogged, flogged bogged mind. This is an image from that nature paper um, and it kind of explains it very well I think. So you've got, um, first of all I love this, this, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, this kind of key of the directories and the file created, whether it's a program. Betty, 
Do not finish. Sorry. Um, and it's nice because there's this kind of stuff which you need to know to be able to understand how a computer vision model works. But you get so bogged down with like understanding how a ResNet and all the different layers, but actually the folder structure is so important. Um, and when you're coding or figuring something out like this, it's it's a lot a lot of the time the problem is it doesn't know where the folder is, and that's because you don't know where the folder is either. Um, but here it's telling you there is a folder, there should be something in that folder, otherwise it's not going to work. Um, so well that, that that's where I kind of make mistakes anyway. So <laughs> it's handy for me. Um, and within this create project, you've got your deep lab cut models, um, your label data, your training data sets, your videos, and your config.yaml. Uh, then you've got your train network, um, but that obviously doesn't happen until you've labeled everything up here. Um, and then here you've kind of got more kind of what we'll cover next week, um, which is basically how the model works, how you can evaluate it and how you can improve it. Um, there is also the option where you can kind of make your labels better. Um, so you can see here, you've got your labeling up here from that you've done initially, but then down here, you can say, oh, actually that purple shouldn't shouldn't be there. It should actually be here. Um, you know, cause, because once you've, once you've trained that model, it then can allow you to kind of go back. Bear with me one minute. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, you can then look back on what you've trained and have your outputs from that initial level of training. You can see that from that new image, it has then done a label, which isn't exactly correct. So you can then go through, refine that label so it is correct and therefore make the correction. So then the next time you run that model, you should have a better kind of accuracy. Um, Next one. So here I've just kind of put a red triangle, a red rectangle around what this kind of video is going to cover, which is the creation of the project. So there's kind of three different ways that you can install Deep Lab Cut. The one that we've done is option number two, um, mainly because that's the one that I kind of thought I'd be the most confident doing. And it's also the one they recommend. Um, you can use a kind of system wide approach, which overrides any current installations on your machine. So if you're a regular Python user, you might actually not want them to overwrite anything you've already got, um, especially when it comes down to version control. Then you've got option three, which um, is you can use the supplied Docker. So they've actually created a Docker container and you can access that and come out from it. And I believe the Docker also gives you like their kind of not their GPU access. I think you also you have to ask them for that, not ask them for that, but obviously do the request to, to use it. Um, and it's already kind of all, all set up. But I think with the Conda environment, the beauty of it is, is a lot of people are kind of already familiar with a con an anaconda and it's um python based as well there we go i just colored it in purple so step number one is to make sure that you've got anaconda installed now i have put in this url so you can use that if you want um the the main way the only way that I've kind of provided documentation on is on is the anaconda way. Um, you can go back to the other ways, but you'd have to follow the guide and not this PowerPoint presentation. Once you click on that URL, this is the page that you'd get, and you'd basically literally just download it here. That's all you've kind of got to do. Then that'll install, and then when you open up anaconda, you will have this kind of pane on this side of your screen. And instead of clicking on home, which will be the default that it lands on, you just wanna click on environments. 
And then you can see here, this is my anaconda um, and I've got four environments. Everyone will have the base root, but then there's these three environments that I've created myself. So I've got SageMaker AWS, Animal Dash Movement and Deep Lab Cut. So first things first is you actually need to create a new environment. Now, the reason that we kind of have these environments isolated is to stop kind of conflicts between multiple different environments. For example, if you've got one package that doesn't work with another package, or if you've got a specific version of a Python package, it won't overwrite it. It'll just remain in that lovely, nice environment without interfering with anything else. So if you click on create, it will then give you an option to, to basically type, type in whatever you want to call your environment. I don't recommend calling it Deep Lab Cut. Um, I learned the hard way. So then I renamed it and created one called Animal Dash Movement. Then within there, what you'll have is something that looks a little bit like this. Um, within there, you'll have all these different kind of cubes and you can install them. Mainly, you don't need to install all of them because it just take up memory that you don't need. Um, but the main ones to kind of install usually are Jupyter Notebook, so this one here. But then also is this cmd.exe. Now, for some reason, the screens have just kind of come apart because I need to update my Anaconda. Um, but you'd click on this and then you would click launch. And then once you launch that, you would get a window that looks something like this. Um, but yours would have nothing in. It would literally just be an open kind of thing with your environment, with your um, location of where your anaconda environment actually is. So if I go right up to the top here, you can see that this was the first line that I had. So I'm just going to highlight it. That was the first line. I had animal dash movement, which was the name of my environment, and then my C drive forward slash users forward slash my name. And then I put in the argument activate deep lab cut. So if we just go back over to the PowerPoint slides. The next step um, to do is these two kind of things actually happen separately. So you've got your anaconda and then you've also got the deep lab cut folder. Um, now, the reason that is, is because the deep lab cut folder is we need to first clone it into our environment. So the way that you sorry, not into our environment, into our um, Internet Explorer. So our, our kind of documents, basically. Now, one thing that you have to make sure of is the location of where your anaconda is installed into is the location of where you want to clone this Git package into. Because if you have one in your C drive, but one in your D drive, it won't work. You ha they have to be in the same one. Because when you then open up your environment and you try and get through Python, um, through your new kind of mind called animal movement environment, you want to be able to change the directory to the conda environment. Now, I'll explain what the conda environment is in a moment. But to do that, you go into your C drive just by default. So that's mainly when you install something, that is where it goes. So if I go into my C drive here, you can see it. Then all I'm going to do is I'm going to click in this bar here, which gives me makes this go blue. So exactly the same as what it looked like on the PowerPoint makes it go blue there and um, you can just see it. And then what I'm going to do is this kind of git clone command. So git clone is the command that I want to ask it to do. And then I'm going to follow it by this specific URL. And I'll also put this in the chat in case anybody wants to have a look at it. Um, George, can I ask a question at this point? Yeah, go for it. About how big is the um, deep lab cut repo? I'm I'm thinking because I'm thinking about, um, you know, setting it up for cloud use. Uh, is it a burden, or it, I know this is just the way that you started doing it, but how easy would it be to set up with the requirements text in Colab? In, in other words, is it really big or is it um, not so big? I don't think it's that big. It's only 238 megabytes. However, 
when I create my project file and put in all my videos footage, it might be big, very big then. Yeah, yeah. And um, and how much how much video footage was memory wise approximately do you do you have now? Um, I've only tested this on one video so far. Um, so but, that but you have more videos than that. Uh, I mean, do you have do you imagine it being more than say 15 gigabytes of video? So far, I've only got around about five gigabytes, but it's only ran over one night. Um, but as I mean, for my specific problem, the cows are actually feeding for longer now. Um, so that is a bit of an issue because obviously that's going to pick up more video. Um, mm. So, yeah, that's something to bear in mind. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, but yeah, the, just the just the gear, it's 239 megabytes. OK, OK, so um, if I type in here, what I'm going to type in is CMD. Now, what that stands for is just a command prompt. So I click enter and then what appears, which by chance has appeared in the wrong screen, is this kind of black box. Now you can see I'm in my C drive because I ran it from my C drive here. I put that CMD command up here. Then I'm going to run git clone. And then if I paste that command and run it, that will then put that deep lab cut into this folder. OK, now I will do it um, quickly, but then I will I will delete it afterwards because obviously I've already got it. But this is literally it's so simple. You just literally just git clone it in there. Um, and while that's doing that, I'm just going to go into my backup one, my original. Um, and you can see I've called it deep lab cut V01, so version one. And you can see that I've got this um, folder called Conda environments. OK, now in this Conda environment folder is everything I need to be able to create that perfect environment to be able to run deep lab cut. So when I go back into my anaconda that hasn't got deep lab cut yet, all it's got is an environment with a command prompt in it. What I tend to do, what I'll do when I go into that anaconda, go into that command prompt within an anaconda is I will change my file directory to this conda environment within my C drive. And I will tell it to look in that in that conda environment and for it to create that conda environment within my anaconda. Um, I know there's a lot of conda words, isn't there? Um, but it, it does make sense. It does make sense. Um, so you can see here it's now uploaded. I've got updating files 100 percent done and it's given me the option to put in another command. And if we look into my C drive now, I've now got this second folder called deep lab cut. Obviously, I don't need that, so I'm just going to delete it. It's just for showing you guys purposes. So yeah, I've got it in here. I renamed it um, just so nothing would clash with it if I did use git clone again. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into here and I'm going to take this Conda environment and I'm actually just going to copy this. Um, we're just going to copy it because that is my location of the Conda environments. So now if I go into my command prompt, so I went into here. Um, I can't actually launch it like that. Oh, will it let me click there? No, so mine's um, playing up. So I'm just going to go into the one that I had open earlier. And um, I'm going to run. It's not going to let me because it's all already open. I'm not going to run that because it will conflict with what I'm going to do later on in the in the PowerPoint presentation. But basically what you do do is you open your command window. Um, and just like explained in step three, you'll go into your command prompt, then you will change your directory to the exact URL that I just copied and pasted. Um, but obviously yours will be different. You might not cause yours lab cut version zero one, but you will still have a folder if you cloned it directly from Git called Conda dash environments. Now you need to make the Anaconda environment, uh, just like what we were just saying, unique for deep cut lab. Um, and you do that by using the conda env for environment create and then you will basically it'll read this deep cut lab dot yaml file that is present within conda environments so i'll just prove that so there you go deep lab cut dot yaml that yaml file is present within conda environments um, we can open it up and it just basically provides details on what it's installing so it's installing python version 3.8 it's installing pip Jupyter, um, 
and all these other things. Then here, um, this deep lab cut that it's also installed in, you can see how it's got this GUI and then it's also got TF. Now, what this is telling is it's saying, OK, use the standard GUI format that Deep Lab Cut have created, but also use TensorFlow TF. So TensorFlow is a massive Python um, package. Um, so it is dependent on that as well. Um, so we'll just cross off that for now. When you do run this, though, it does take a lot of time. Um, obviously, it's doing a lot, a lot of things. Then the next step is you want to now access your deep cut lab installation. So to do that, you then open up your new command prompt. So not the previous one. You can close that one. You will use the term activate, which will activate deep lab, deep lab cut. Then you will say, OK, now using Python minus M deep lab cut. And that will basically open the deep lab cut software. Now that software looks something like this. Um, so this will pop up. You'll have a new kind of square down there, just like I do. I have a little square. Obviously, I've done some things with mine, so it doesn't look exactly the same. Um, and you can see it's called Deep Lab Cut Project Manager GUI 2.3.3. Um, this is an open source thing, so this doesn't cost any money. It's totally free. Um, as long as you obviously, if you do publish anything, you must cite them. Um, and you can either create a new project, you can load a project, or you can go into the model zoo, which was the thing I was talking about earlier, where they've just made Pacific models that can um, have been adapted for a particular kind of set of training data, um, just to increase the accuracy of that model. So there's a lot going on, um, and that is literally just how to get it up and running and, and get it started. Um, obviously, it'd be great if you guys had a go at that, especially if you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, and if anyone does want to have a go at it, but they have any problems, if you, you feel free to just send me a Teams because I've literally spent a lot of time on this. Um, <laughs> I know I know it doesn't look like much to condense it into like a 25 minute PowerPoint presentation. Um, but the thing is, when you look at this stuff and you read all the different ways of doing one thing, it's hard to kind of sieve out what is actually important and uh, what you're actually focusing in on and, and the method that you're going to use just to install this thing. Um, but yeah. So I then clicked create new project or oh, just to add here as well. So this is a user interface. You can do it just using raw code. So you don't have to use the user interface. Um, but for the purposes of this, I haven't used the user interface just until I feel a little bit more confident and understand what everything is doing and why it's doing that. Um, I probably will use the user interface next week as well. Um, or if I feel confident by then, I have looked at it. It is pretty simple on how to use it, but it's understanding why um, that is also important as well. But if it is fairly straightforward and simple, then I'll share that with you guys next week. Um, it is also well documented within that nature paper that was on one of the previous slides. So when I got to this point, I clicked on create new project um, and this basically gave me a kind of. Holding page and it asked me what I wanted to call it, so I called my project CalCam um, and then the next question was, what is the experimenter? So I put my name, um, Georgina Wager, um, and then it basically created this um url uh, not url sorry path net path location um of where my project would be then i also added a video when that holding page came up um and i put the video in there i literally only put one video in and then i went on to this tab here which is just extracting the frames like i said there's loads of different things here that you can select so you've got automatic or manual You've got k-means or uniform selection. Um, k-means is an algorithm within um, machine learning. Then you've got frame cropping. So I wanted, I didn't want that, so I disabled it. I've got the slider width and the cluster step. Now I don't fully understand what all of these things mean, um, but hopefully by next week I'll, I'll know a bit more on that. Then I clicked extract frames. Now this took a minute or two, to be honest, it didn't happen very quickly and I only actually had one video in there. Um, I've got no GPU, so I am just using 
the computer processing unit. I'm not using anything special on this. Um, then that ran quietly and it basically went from being this kind of clickable, so you can highlight over it, to being nothing when I clicked extract the frames. Then I clicked label frames and when I clicked uh, this button here on the label frames, what I actually had come up is, um, is this. So this was the video that I put in. And just to show you my video um, pre-processing, I'll just bring it over here. It's a good video. It's a video of a cow eating. Um, so the thing that I'm interested in is what kind of behaviours does a cow kind of show at the feed trough? And is there a relationship between those type of those type of feed, those type of behaviours and the amount of feed that has left the feed trough at, at that time point? Um, you might be able to tell that this is a grow safe bin, so it's got weights on it. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to say, OK, if a cow makes X number of bites and the cow is this age, this live weight, we can then say, OK, approximately that's taken an X amount of grams per bite. And we know it's done this amount of bites. So therefore, we know that that cow has eaten this amount within that given time period. Um, it might not be 100 percent accurate, it might only be 50 percent accurate, um, but it'd still be an improvement on what's readily available and cheap and free um, to set up this kind of thing. So you can see on my thing here, um, there's a lot of different elements to it. You've got the opacity, opacity of the of the actual video image. You've got the point size. So by point size, we literally mean the dot. So if I just an example. Oh, Second, let me just um it does get a bit overwhelmed and then tell me it's not responding all the time. You can get various software and you're also running Teams and it's on your laptop and all of those things. Yeah, it's just too much going on for it, I think, sometimes. <clears throat> um but just just why this is loading, I don't know if it will load because it's it's been giving me issues all afternoon but you can see here that i've got body, body part one body part two now i can edit those body parts um, and give them a, the label that i actually want to happen now obviously this actual image here because the way we did um the recording on the camera was that it would record five seconds before the animal went in and five seconds after the animal left so therefore, I'm going to have a period, a, a few frames either side of the animal being present that are just going to be nothingness like this. Um, so obviously, this one here is kind of irrelevant. You can see that it's given me 17 frames. Um, so I've got zero out of 17 there. Um, and you can you can change the size of the points and obviously label them based on which one it is. But I, I don't think it's going to work. And just close some stuff down. Maybe while we're waiting, um, what do you think is going to happen? So what what happens is it comes up with a cursor just the same way that you would draw a box around in YOLO mark um, and it just comes up with a cursor and you just basically click and it puts the dot on where you've said it. So it's literally just an, an application to be able to label the data. But instead of labeling it with a bounding box, you're labeling it with a dot and that dot identifies the body part. <laughs> Is the dot equivalent, do you think, to a bounding box? Yes. Say, yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're identifying a feature that you want the deep learning model to recognize in every frame. Yes. Um, 
I wonder um, <clears throat> if you have 10 minutes of 30 frames per second um, video uh, per video, and let's say you have 100 of videos like that. Um, what, what is the best strategy for creating your training data set? Are there guidelines in DeepCut? For example, do you label every frame of one video or do you label one frame per minute from every minute of every video or something different? Um, from what I've read in, in the papers, it depends on the application. Um, so for example, if you've got like my problem here, I've got the same background every time. So therefore there's not that much kind of uniqueness in the data. Um, so therefore I might have more labels per frame, uh, more frames per video compared to if I had, for example, they're up there kind of reasoning with the cheetah one was that when the cheetah is running, it's got a different background every time with different vegetation. Um, so they actually labeled less. What do you mean by less? Uh, how many frames for just for a ballpark um, to help us understand? Um, I haven't got an exact figure, but I can get the paper up. I, can put oh, I, I don't mean to look at a paper while you're talking. I just wondered if it was in your mind. Um, so for, for example, like labeling, if you have 20 dots, that's your wire frame, labeling 10,000 frames is pretty hard. Yeah, it's a big task, but I think the purpose of this kind of <clears throat> the way they've worded it in that nature paper is that the purpose is you don't have to do that many labels compared to if you were doing a normal model. They're basically saying that using deep lab cut, you haven't actually got to label as much. Um, so it might sound like a lot. Obviously, from a past experience, I don't know yet. I can't argue that that is right or wrong. I guess it just depends on the quality of the labels, how many labels that you've got for each scenario. Um, but yeah, I guess unless you've run it, it's hard to know what you what you need for that specific problem. Uh, what, what, it, I, what I think this think. is doing is, uh, as I think that you're using, rather than building a deep learning model from scratch, I think you're labeling some some areas in uh, frames of a video and you're using transfer learning and probably most of that 230 megabytes is the model weights from a general animal model then you're using training uh, transfer learning on your smaller data set to pick up those bits and connect the rods mm -hmm. and there'll be, there'll be another model that um, connects the wire frame between each of the different feature sets that you're identifying I'm I'm really interested to see like if you do a hundred frames, how it behaves. Uh, just just a hundred and no more. Yeah, I definitely recommend the Nature paper because it does go into detail. There's there's loads of different. They talk about the frame rate and they explain why they use this amount for this problem and why they use this amount for that problem. Um, so it is it is really good, but it did change every time. There's not just like one exact figure that they were kind of given. Yeah, but you have to start somewhere. So yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Sorry about this. It's really annoying. I might just close it down and start again. Oh, it doesn't even want to close. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, there we go. I'm just going to reload it from my anaconda.
And do you find that your anaconda takes forever to load? Feels like forever sometimes. Um, it takes a few seconds, but I don't find it. Or maybe I'm just used to it. I feel like compared to everything else, it takes forever. Oh, it is quite hefty. And uh, did anybody notice that the newest R Studio seems to be uh, launching uh, a bit longer than the previous one? Is it the same experience? Yeah, I felt that as well. Yeah, yeah. same here. It is, yeah. it is. But then they've changed something about the graphical user interface, and it, it takes longer on at least on Windows PCs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to kind of reiterate what was in the slides, I've. I'm not doing all the other previous stuff because this environment is already set up for me to use. I've already installed Deep Lab Cut. So I'm going to just activate Deep Lab Cut. And then it does all of this stuff. And then now you can see that my animal movement environment has changed to Deep Lab Cut environment. Um, and then the next thing that I do is I just put Python minus M Deep Lab Cut. And if you just watch this bottom task, bottom bar here, You'll you'll see the the window pop up. This takes a moment just to load. Out of curiosity, George, which laptop are you running this on? Is it the field the beast. notebook? Yeah, the beast. I can't remember what it's got in it. How much RAM do you have there? Sixteen. I think it's. I think it might be the one up from there. Maybe 32. Can't read it upside down. I'll check the settings later and have a look. Uh, here you go. So this is now open this. So I'm going to, I'm actually going to click load projects because I should already have a project set up because um, I did it before. So if I go into deep lab cut, I don't know if it'll be in there though. I haven't yet navigated it from this point. I was a bit scared to close it in case it disappeared. If it be in here, no. No, nothing in there. So I'm going to just do the create new project. So again, I called it Georgina. No, I didn't. I called it Calcam. Experimental one. Then I browse videos. <clears throat> oh, here it is. Ah, here you go. Sorry. So it was in my desktop. So I'm just going to go back actually and uh, load project in my desktop. You've got your setting down there on config files. Put it to show all down there in the lower right. Oh, won't let you. So it's looking for your config file. Yeah, it, it said it was in my desktop. It found it then. Is there a YAML file in that folder on your desktop? Not that I've seen. I didn't. I didn't see it actually save anything to my desktop. Like I've got. I've got my desktop on my other screen. And there's nothing physically on it. I'll just do create new project. I'll have to investigate that later. I'm just going to browse videos again. Uh, go into my computer, into my D drive, into my OneDrive, into my documents, into the location where my videos are stored. I'm going to select this video here, so I'm literally just putting in one video.
sorry, the error that I'm getting now, I don't know if you can tell, but my button has now hidden and it did this earlier and then it just fixed itself. So I didn't think there was an issue, but maybe there is. Uh, see, you can see this is the one that I had initially. Can you see that, Ed? This is the initial one yep. that I did before. And when you click it, it's you know clearly explained your config gram, your videos, everything. Oh, it's weird, I isn't it? I didn't see that folder when you went to the um. It's not on my desktop either, so it's, it's telling me, look, um, if I click on George Wager, see users, desktop. Oh. It might reappear if I try it. Here we go, look. So in users, George Wager, desktop, it's there. Uh -huh. And there, there they all are. OK, well, go back and navigate there. They use C drive. Users, Joy Ranger. Desktop. There you go. Choose. OK, OK. Create. You need to put some videos in there. There, wait, is, wait. there is there is one in there should be in there uh, so it's, George... it's, it's not that it's um, not an asset you have on your hard drive it's that it's an asset you need to inform the project of i think so i'm just attempting to go load project c drive users george wager and then there should be a folder in here that says desktop ah here we go open it wants the YAML. There you go. Open. <clears throat> Boom. Thank you, Ed. Then my frames are already extracted. So therefore, I should be able to just click label frames and that same thing that came up should just come up. Select folder. I'm going to give it a minute. Here we go. So it's built up, then it's called Napari. This separate section is. OK. So this is where we were previously before it froze. So that gives me a selection. I don't need a selection. That gives me a dot. And the reason it's come purple is because it thinks it's body part one. So I'm just going to click undo. So I deleted that one layer. Now there isn't actually any points on here that I can label. So I'm going to click next. And now this will give me a separate point. So. Is that the very next frame in that video? Yeah, so it goes this one. And then this one. How, how many um, frames per second are you shooting, like 24 or something? Uh, it did mention on the previous one, extract frames. And uh, I think it says it in the YAML, you know. Uh, I meant in your source video. Oh, I'm not entirely sure. OK. Not entirely sure. Um, so in this image, I 
I think um, what I would suggest that we have four minutes left, and I think I would suggest um, uh, just wrapping it up in a recap um, and where we're headed to next week. <clears throat> yes, so um, I'll go, I'll make this go bigger. So basically next week, hopefully I just want to build on this. I've still got a lot more learning to do. Um, but I'd like to get it to a point where we can actually train the model um, and then we'd be able to give it a video and it'd be able to actually identify each body part on the new video that it hasn't seen, so unseen data. Um, overall, the purpose of this was to introduce Deep Lab Cut, show you what it can, well, show the applications of it and how it has been used so you guys can think about how you guys might use it or it might be useful to you. Um, to demonstrate how to actually get it installed, um, how to do that correctly. Um, little things like the C drive and the D drive are obviously quite important. Um, and to kind of demonstrate how to use it in some sense um, to get up to the point of creating a project. Um, so hopefully next week we'll be able to work on labeling the data, um, training the model, and then looking at the outputs of that trained model. Oh yeah. I wonder. Um, I wonder if if the graphical user interface for labeling pictures uh, would be usable in an environment like Colab. The, <clears throat> I think you know? it is. Yeah. I think it is, but that's what the initial confusion is, is because there's so many different ways to do this stuff. Um, they just give you too much choice, to be honest. Um, but yeah. Because obviously the, the doing it in Colab will actually give you some free GPU when you come to train in the model. But there is actual <laughs> code lines. You don't have to use the software that I've used to do the labeling. You can actually just use the command, the commands. The reason um, <clears throat> I think it might be an idea to consider that is um, one, if you had a GitHub repo, <clears throat> Pointing the data to a, a shared link in your in your um, in Google or uh, even if it was you know not huge like you only had I can't remember what the size limit constraint they give you on GitHub is. Do you remember? Is it five gigabytes? But no one file bigger than fifty megabytes, something like that. Mm -hmm. If you had that, it would <clears throat> one it would be fast in the early stages. Um, two, it would be something that. Um, you could have collaborators on and uh, it, it probably is a long term solution since you don't have a GPU. Um, you know, then you have a GPU and it'll just be way faster in the long run. Mm -hmm. I think think about that um, hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I will. I just kind of I wanted to do it this way because I wanted to understand. It's like with DSAT, when you use the interface, you kind of understand everything do you know what I mean instead of just lines of code you know why it's that way so I kind of wanted to understand it so yeah it's a, a learning curve it definitely is a big beast though very big beast I wonder if there's a um you're doing it the most hardcore of hardcore ways by um starting off uh from scratch with your own data and I wonder if there is a um an argument for going through a boxed tutorial, say with example data in their in their um, as they have a model zoo. Um, mm -hmm. That's the way like those hugging face tutorials are all set up on SageMaker Studio Lab. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Thanks, George, I'm, and I'm really looking forward to next week. Um, I have to go now because there's a meeting right after this, a different one. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, George. See you next week. Some of you I'll see next door in a different meeting and I'll uh, stop the video here. I will endeavor over my, my break.